We're here today with Michelle Reyes, co-author with Helen Lee of a new book titled The Race Wise Family, 10 Postures to Becoming Households of Healing and Hope. Michelle is an Indian American writer, speaker, and activist whose work on faith and culture has been featured in Christianity Today, Faithfully Magazine, Pathios, and more. She's also the Vice President of the Asian American Christian Collaborative and Editorial Director at PAX. Michelle is also the author of Becoming All Things, How Small Changes Lead to Lasting Connections Across Cultures, which was recently named winner of the 2022 ECPA Christian Book Award for New Authors. Congratulations, uh, Michelle, for that. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> Michelle lives in Austin, Texas with her husband, Aaron, and two kids, and you can learn more at penguinrandomhouse.com as well as Michelle's website. Um, Michelle, thanks so much for uh, joining us, and I'm uh, just so thrilled about the th things you've done here with these two books. Oh, thank you. Thanks for, for having me for, for this chat. Uh, you know, it's crazy, the this month, the month of May, uh, you know, being API Heritage Month, but then also all of the, the, the shootings uh, that, are, that are taking place, um, and just all of the the racial brokenness that we are just being inundated with through the news, through viral videos. Um, it's heartbreaking. Uh, and, and it has just been a, a confirmation for Helen and I of how much more we need to be having these conversations in our home with our kids, you know, with our, our churches. Uh, so I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, it's, it, it you know, it's a sad time for a book to be releasing, but we are we are hoping that this book, uh, you know, the Race Wise Family, can feel, in the midst of, of racial tragedies, Christian parents can have conversations with their kids, lament, grieve, uh, point point their kids to God, and uh, so yeah, we're we're excited to get this book in, in, into into parents uh, and caregivers' hands. I mean, you're right. I mean, in terms of the need for it, my goodness, um, you know, it just keeps getting worse. It seems like. And, um, you know, having a resource like you guys have created, um, I think it's just essential. So, Thank you. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. Especially, um, I, you know, something that Helen and I talk about a lot is just, you know, that question of like how many uh, books by Asian Americans do you have on your, on your bookshelf? And, yeah. and particularly by Asian American women, Asian American Christian women, uh, you know, I think people are, I think there's a general growing population of folks growing in their racial consciousness and understanding that we need to care about race related issues. Uh, but I do think there is still that potential for people to fall into the black white binary when it comes mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. conversations on race, thinking that race is a problem between black people and white people. Uh, and so, you know, we're here in our book trying to bring everybody's stories to the table and to say, hey, this is a conversation we need to be having between Asian Americans, Latinos, African Americans, you know, Caucasians, mixed folks, and, and more. And so um, to be able to write this, me as a, a second generation Indian American, uh, Helen Lee as a second generation Korean American, and just to talk about our racialized experiences as Asian American women, I think is also really powerful and hopefully brings a new dynamic to conversations on race as well. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Totally agree. I mean, I even had a white American woman kind of telling me that something along the lines that she didn't believe that Asian Americans were discriminated against. She said it was, it was really an issue of black and white, you know, and it's like, really, you really, you know, haven't you been watching the news? Have you talked to any Asian Americans about that? You know, so I just couldn't believe I was really surprised when I heard this person say that. Yeah. Yeah. There's an organization called Launch. It's Launch with two A's, L-A-A-U-N-C-H. And they do a whole bunch of surveys uh, and studies related to Asian Americans. Uh, and they put out a study last year uh, that showed that uh, a, a large number of white Americans don't know what's happening to the Asian American community. They're just unaware that wow. anti-Asian racism exists. And I think it was also somewhere between 30 to 40% don't believe that anti-Asian violence wow. uh, is, or anti-Asian racism is a, is a real issue or a problem in our country. So um, I think it's clear that we're, we're not watching the same news channels. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're definitely not... Um, in communities where we're having these conversations, a lot of people are insulated in their yes. own monocultural spaces, uh, and so we don't know what's going on. And, and if 
and we don't know what we don't know, right? If we're not seeing it, if we're not personally uh, experiencing it, uh, sometimes human tendency is to say it doesn't exist. Uh, and so this is why we need to be hearing from each other. We need to be listening to, to, to thought leaders, Christian leaders uh, of different ethnic backgrounds, um, because otherwise we're, we're, we're going to be unaware and then we're going to come to faulty conclusions like it's not important or doesn't, you know, these race related issues don't exist. So, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So before we get to your books, can you tell folks a little bit more about your background? Yeah, definitely. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm second generation bicultural Indian American. Uh, my, my mother is 100% ethnically Indian, but my father is blonde haired, blue eyed of German British uh, descent. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's fun because I am a mom, I have a seven year old son and a three year old daughter. Uh, my son looks very much like me, kind of like, you know, my 2.0 uh, darker caramel colored skin, dark brown hair, dark brown eyes. Uh, but our three-year-old daughter has blonde curly hair and blue eyes and fair skin. And so, wow. you know, beauties of a multiracial family yes, of multi-ethnic yes. uh, backgrounds. Uh, you know, I was born in South Carolina, raised in Minnesota, and now live in Austin, Texas. Uh, mm. And it's, it's interesting because, um, there is a growing number of Asians and, and, and South Asians in particular in Austin, uh, although there is a very high demographic of uh, Latinos in, 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 in Austin. And my last name is Reyes because I'm married to a second generation Mexican-American. So <laughs> there's all these multi-layered racialized experiences that I have, sometimes because people see my brown skin, sometimes because I don't fit into the typical Indian slash Asian stereotype, but then also sometimes because people misidentify me as a Latina. Wow. Uh, and so uh, a lot of those different stories are, are, are in the book as well. Hmm. Hmm. So one of the things I mentioned is that, you know, you're VP of the Asian American Christian Collaborative. Can you tell folks about that? Yeah, definitely. So the Asian American Christian Collaborative was formed uh, by by uh, my colleague Raymond Chang, the president of the ACC and myself uh, back in March of of 2020 as anti-Asian racism was rising and we were just hearing from friends as well as from folks around the country, uh, particularly Asian American Christians, that not only did uh, they feel invisible because when they would talk about these experiences, uh, whether in the church or outside, they were dismissed, uh, but just kind of carrying that trauma, either firsthand or secondhand, witnessing what was what was going around. And it came to a head where people were reaching out to us and saying, hey, my my church just called me a snowflake for talking about anti-Asian uh, racism, <laughs> or my, my church made fun of me, or they you know, were very condescending. And we said, okay, enough is enough. We need to say something. Because this is a moment for the church to rise up and they're, you know, we don't see them doing it. And so we put out the statement on anti-Asian racism in the time of uh, COVID-19. Uh, that was the end of March. And, you know, within a few weeks, uh, the statement garnered over 10,000 signatures. So it really kind of made an impact, not only in local churches, but local uh, universities, colleges, uh, Princeton, Harvard, a lot of college presidents were reading it. Um, and in the statement, not only did we address the reality of anti-Asian racism, but we called churches to publicly denounce racism of all forms from the pulpit and in uh, discipleship processes and, and, and more. And so um, that's a little bit of the work, and AACC was born from that, and that's a little bit of the work we do at AACC. We, uh, we seek to encourage and equip the Asian American Christian community um, and friends of our community to follow Christ holistically. Uh, we want to equip people to go into the streets to, to, to uh, push forth gospel rooted justice in their communities um, that's that's scripturally based and so we do educational uh, type content through our reclaim podcast and a reclaim publication uh, but we also have communities uh, gatherings and then uh, advocacy you know we've uh, organized a march in Chicago in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd, uh, which in many ways was very historic. We had somewhere between one to 2,000 Asian American and African American Christians march side by side um, to stand for, for Black Lives and Dignity. Uh, and, and then after the March 16th uh, Atlanta massacre last year in 2021, we we partnered with local churches and organizations to organize 14 different prayer rallies in 14 cities across the country. 
Uh, and it was really, I think it was a big moment for the Asian American Christian community. I, I don't think we had seen a national movement like that before, where Asian American Christians have felt like they were given a public space to lament, mm. to grieve, to feel mm. like their voices could be heard, um, and that their, their experiences could be validated. And so, um, exciting things happening within the ACC and within the Asian American Christian community um, and, and just encouraging people to continue to follow Christ holistically, loving our neighbors uh, holistically. And so, um, yeah, encourage folks, you can, you can go to Asian American Christian collaborative.com or follow us on our socials at AA Christ collab uh, to see more of what we're doing these days. Good, good. Um, in the introduction, I didn't mention that you're involved with Red Bud Writers um, organization. And so obviously we have a lot of writers as part of our um, audience. So could you tell folks a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. So I serve on the board of Redbud. Um, I I have much of my early writing career uh, to owe to Redbud and the community there and the support I received there. Uh, and, and it really is an incredible Christian women's uh, writers guild. And so if you're you're interested, you know, feel free to reach out. But um, yeah, I so I have a little bit of a, a checkered <laughs> professional career. Uh, I started off as a German professor. So my huh. uh, my PhD is in uh, 18th century German literature. I used wow. to teach uh, folklore, fantasy, mythology. Um, I taught up in Chicago and then actually uh, locally in Austin when we first moved down to church plant. Um, long story short, in 2017, our, the university I was teaching at underwent budget cuts and my job disappeared overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought, you know, maybe this is a time to redirect and, and pursue full-time vocational ministry alongside my husband um, with our church plant. And so in 2008 or in 2017 was when I first began pitching articles to Christianity Today and the Gospel Coalition and all these other sites um, and, uh, and just started dipping my feet in that, in that pool and really felt a calling to not only talk about the work of our church, a minority-led multicultural church on, on the east side, which historically you still see the effects of segregation today in, um, you know, what does ministry look like in urban, multicultural, disadvantaged communities, uh, but also, you know, how can Christians uh, appropriately, biblically engage with issues of culture and race. And so that's kind of where I got my starts. And uh, five years later, uh, you know, I, I just... Uh, I love the work that I do. I love writing and speaking into these issues. Um, I feel that there's many more books uh, in, inside of me, and so just excited where where, where, where God will take a, take uh, my writing career from here. Good, good, good. That's so wonderful to hear all that um, history. So um, let's talk about the first book, Becoming All Things. Um, how did that come about? Yeah, well, I think just in, in church planting, in... Uh, equipping our own congregants with how to love our neighbors on the east side. I think there was just a lot of questions about, like, how do we love people who are of a different ethnicity than us? How do we connect across cultures? And even that question of, like, how do I, how do I make friends with somebody of a different culture without, you know, completely offending them? How do I, like, not say the wrong? thing. Uh, and, and so a lot of our day-to-day -day vocational ministry involved crossing cultures. It involved Latinos reaching out to African Americans, uh, Black congregants reaching out to, you know, Vietnamese and Indian congregants, you know, community members. Uh, and so I think a lot of it has just been an outpouring of our own ministry on the ground for my husband and I. And and feeling the real need to want to equip the church. Um, I feel like in some ways becoming all things is, is my love letter to the church <laughs> to, <laughs> to just uh, to show the biblical precedent behind it. Cause I think even still in the year 2022, we have so many evangelical churches that, that either don't see the importance of engaging in issues of culture and race, either they, they see it as a political uh, agenda, a secular agenda, a woke agenda, um, either, either there's a disinterest or they're just afraid of, of losing their donor base or making people upset. Um, so there's a lot of uh, keeping the status quo. And so I wanted to write a book 
that had um, theological underpinnings to it that really traced a theology of culture throughout scripture to say, no, this is, this is God's heart. <laughs> this is part of what it means to be the people of God. Uh, and then to give very clear practical steps that felt um, easy and doable for the average person. Uh, and so, so that, that's my heart. It's, it's, it's a book for individuals, but it's also a book that uh, I, I, I have seen already serve and equip the church and, and, and I hope will continue to do so. So um, let's talk about the new book that I mentioned that you wrote with Helen Lee. The title is The Race Wise Family, 10 Postures to Becoming Households of Healing and Hope. And so what motivated you and Helen to work together to uh, create that? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, the last two years, we, we started writing this book in, in the year 2000, <laughs> like right before uh, everything happened with uh, the, you know, May and, and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, like we started writing right around that time. And I think what we noticed was that a lot of parents, Christian parents, were leaving education on issues of race and culture to other sources, whether it was their church or their school or just not engaging it at all in the home. And, and we found that very surprising, um, not only because we believe in a rich theology of culture and race in scripture, um, but also because we are so inundated with these issues right now. And uh, what we wanted to communicate to parents is that our children are constantly being formed on these issues. Uh, they're constantly being formed in positive or negative directions. You're never just un, unformed by, by something. Uh, and to try to kind of shake or wake up Christian parents to say, hey, if you're not engaging in this, your children are learning from it elsewhere. Uh, with potentially no biblical guidance uh, on, on this topic. And so, um, yes, we believe the church should be speaking into these issues. Yes, children should be um, learning about race, uh, God's heart for race and culture at church, but it begins in the home. And so what we want is as parents to begin taking those intentional steps to addressing it, uh, in stable times, but then also in, in, in the midst of and in the aftermath of racial tragedies, to point their children to Christ uh, and, and, and to then have whatever else in their life, whether it's church or Christian extracurriculars or whatnot, to build upon what's happening in the home. But, but this, is, this is a book to say, parents, we got to do more. We got to step up. Um, this, this, these have to be intentional conversations. So um, in the book description, it says that um, the book includes, quote unquote, immediately applicable action steps. So it must be very practical then. That is the hope. Every chapter has family activities that you could, you know, do at the dinner table. Uh, every chapter has a prayer. Uh, we have a ton of appendices as well, which people have already pointed out that they absolutely love. We have a movie and book guide that's, that's uh, based on ages uh, of different films and, and, and books people could watch to and have discussion questions on. Um, we have an appendix which is all about kid-friendly definitions, like a one-sentence explanation of uh, privilege or one-sentence explanation of culture. Hmm. Uh, and, and we have a quiz that families can take, a multi-ethnicity quotient assessment, uh, and conversation starters, and more. So we're hoping this is a book that parents could be reading throughout the day and then take to the dinner table or the breakfast table and begin having conversations with their kids right, right away. I think as moms, you know, we know that we don't have a lot of time, so we wanted to like get the Bible and then get the, the practical. And so we're, we're hoping that we, we were able to balance those two. So our um, mutual friend, Darina Williamson, uh, called the book a landmark work for our generation. What do you think makes this book so unique? I, th I think a number of things. One, uh, again, I, I don't know of uh, many books or any books, I think, that are written about this topic on Christian parenting on issues of race and culture from two Asian American Christian women. So I think that's significant. Um, but I think also, too, there's a lot of books out there on race, on justice, on culture that 
are very theoretical. You know, there's a lot of talking points, a lot of ideation, um, but it's not necessarily, here's how this works out in my life. Here's how I've been journeying and working out these these uh, ideas with my kids, with my family, in, in my uh, social spaces. And so I think that blending of theology and praxis, uh, orth- orthodoxy and orthopraxy, if you will, um, is also incredibly unique. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Um, and also Vivian Mabuni says, um, as parents, we can become overwhelmed by the conversation on race, not knowing where to turn and which voices to trust. Helen Lee and Michelle Reyes are two leaders I know, trust and respect. So the whole concept of the speed of trust is something I've been thinking a lot more about lately. Mm-hmm. Can you tell how you think this applies in this particular case? Yeah, well, I think what draws a lot of folks to Helen and I just personally, and I think by extension to our book, is that our book is very invitational. Um, You know, I think even for myself, and I have conversations on race and culture all the time, I get very discouraged when people come out swinging (laughs) on these issues. And we certainly need Christians uh, practicing or exercising their prophetic voice, calling out sin, calling out the sins of racism and injustice for sure. Um, But in scripture, we see that the prophetic voice is always paralleled with the pastoral voice. There's a calling out Mm -hmm. and a a calling in, if you will, you know, calling in, inviting to a better way to the, to the way of Jesus. And so um, I think about how it says, you know, first Corinthians 12, like if our words are not full of love, they're like resounding gongs. Right. And so I think, if we come to the conversation on race and we're just shaming each other, <laughs> we're just canceling each other, that there's no path to healthy uh, pro- progression from there. I mean, I think about for myself, like when I've been shamed by people, I mean, I either get very defensive or I just want to shut down and be like, well, <laughs> like, I guess I need to quit. You know, I, I didn't do this right. I don't, I don't want to get shamed again. And so I think people need to realize if we want to have healthy paths forward of healing and hope when it comes to the conversation on race, it has to be, you know, in this humble uh, invitational, like, let's let's do this together uh, type approach. And so that's what we're hoping uh, this book comes across as with that tone and voice. Good, good. So um, what would be like the number one thing that you would want people to take away from the book? Yeah, I think, um, you know, being a race-wise family at its core is coming to God and seeking wisdom on race-related issues. And and obviously, it's a very complex topic, and there are a lot of steps on the journey. But I think step one is having a posture as a family that whenever whenever stuff hits the fan, <laughs> right, like, like, think about this past month when it comes to the shootings that we're seeing on TV, um, for us as, as Christian families to have a posture of let's pray about it, like let's go to God in prayer uh, and let's see what God's word has to say about this issue. Like if we can begin with that foundation with our children, whether they're age five or age 15, um, that their posture of heart is to always go to prayer and to reading God's word to, to, you know, to slow down, like it says in James, you know, be, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and to really allow God to, to give wisdom and clarity. Um, I think we're setting the, the, the right foundation, uh, you know, when it comes to this issue. So I think if people take away that, they're, they're on the right path uh, moving forward. Good. So um, you mentioned that you feel like you've got quite a few more books inside of you. Uh, <laughs> which I think is great, and I can totally believe that. Um, are there any future projects that you're able to talk about at this point, or is it too early? Oh, my goodness. I have I have so many projects in the <laughs> works, Brian. Even so, if it's not books, what other kind some, of future Some I can't mention about? specifically, but I will say this. Uh, you know, I, as a German professor, I used to teach folklore, fantasy, mythology. Um, it's always been my dream to write fiction. Huh. Huh. Um, so that's a future hope, a future goal. Uh, I do have a project in the works to, 
to some sort of multicultural roadmap for churches, you know, how to move beyond simply multi-ethnic and become multicultural. Um, so a couple projects uh, in the works, and I'm hoping to be able to share them more uh, fully soon. Good, good. Well, we'll look forward to that. Um, again, the name of the new book is The Race Wise Family, 10 Postures to Becoming Households of Healing and Hope by Michelle Reyes and Helen Lee. And um, Michelle, thanks again for all your work and for sharing it with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. I so appreciate it. Our pleasure.